Good morning. morning. Greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his guests. He is our host today. On Sunday, we celebrate all the good things God has done for us because we gather together in the name of our Savior to praise him and thank him for his faithfulness in serving God in his life and also serving us now in interceding for us before the throne of God in heaven. What a glorious Savior. We welcome you that are watching us through video this morning. Trust that you have come anticipating the blessing of the Lord. We're going to begin this morning where it all began for us. At Calvary. And those of you who are at home and you're using a hymn book, the, the hymn number is number 313. I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found me. of ten strings as we praise the Lord on the second verse. By God's word at last my sin I learned that I trembled at the law I spurned till my guilty soul and foreign turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to plan, oh, the grace that brought it down to man, oh, the mighty God that God did span at Calvary, mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at The congregation may be seated. At Calvary, where it all began, salvation's plan fulfilled and finished. And then each of us have experienced a time when we sensed in a very real way that he touched me. And that's the next song we'll be singing, 314. But I would share with you this. A songwriter has once written, and I'm sure sometimes this is your experience. There are times so dark that I seek in vain for the face of my friend divine. Though the darkness hide, he doth safely guide by the touch of his hand on mine. The touch of his hand on mine, oh, the touch of his hand on mine, there is grace and power in the trying, trying hour by the touch of his hand on mine. He touched me. Shackled by a heavy burden Neath the load of guilt and shame There the hand of Jesus touched me And 
and now I am no longer the same. He touched me, oh, he touched me. And all oh, the joy that floods my soul, something happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. Since I met this blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, Him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me, oh, he touched me. And all oh, the joy that floods my soul, something happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. Then we go to number 492 in your hymnal. Since the Lord has touched our lives, then daily it is our experience of simply being able to lean on him. Leaning on the everlasting, the scripture, De Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a Peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk! In this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from the day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, I'm leaning, safe and secure from all. arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so dear. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, I'm leaning. Safe and secure from That fellowship, that fellowship, it continues day by day and will for every, every day henceforth. And it will be that we have a destination. It's heaven in the presence of the Lord who loves us and is praying for us even now. But as, we're, as we are leaning on the everlasting arms that we conclude this part of our worship time in uh, hymn number 336, we're marching to Zion. Let's stand together. Come with that love the Lord and let your joys be known. Join in a song with 
sweet accord, joined in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne, and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. Marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly fields, before we reach the heavenly fields, or walk the golden streets or walk the golden streets we're marching to zion beautiful beautiful zion we're marching upward to zion the beautiful city of god then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's crowd. We're marching through Emmanuel's crowd to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this blessed time wherein we gather in our Savior's name, being confident of this very thing, that they that were two or three are gathered in his name. There he will be found in the midst of them. And so, Lord, we thank you and we welcome you. We ask that you would presence yourself in a very real way in lives that come before you this morning in real need, Father. We pray that you will be to them, Lord, in special measure, in grace, what they need from you. Father, thank you that you have told us in your word, the Lord thy God hath been with thee, thou hast lacked nothing. So thank you for him, Heavenly Father, and thank you for the touch of the Lord in our lives day by day. May we lean upon him, Lord, as we walk day by day, anticipating someday to stand in the throne room of God, declaring not only have we marched to Zion, we have come into the very presence of the King Eternal. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Well, thank you, Ed. Thank you for that beautiful leadership and uh, leading us to Zion. A very very significant. I was, uh, so I've, so there was a guy who comes to our church every now and then named Fred. Fred comes with, um, I'm going to forget her name, Lois Millette. And uh, one day I said to Fred, do you ever listen to WDCX, like uh, 99.5, and, or do you listen to classical 96.3? And he said, well, actually, I listen to 94.5 WNED in Buffalo which is a great classic station. So every Sunday morning, I listen to WNED, just to let you know. I'm not promoting it. They're not giving me any money. Uh, but it's a great classical station. So as I'm thinking through my sermon this morning, uh, the song that comes on is, uh, Bow Thou Down to Me. 
and it was a psalm, it was a rendition of Psalm 68, and at the end of Psalm 68, they bring you to uh, Jeremiah, which ends with, we're going to the city of Zion, and we're going to be talking a lot about Zion this morning, so thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for lining this all up. Um, if you have your Bibles open, uh, and I encourage you, every Sunday, every Sunday, I tell you to bring your Bibles. Uh, I won't ask you if you did or not, but please, because it's so important that you're in the Word of God with me. And uh, I'm going to take you to uh, Romans chapter 11, and uh, we're going to take our sermon from that section of Scripture, although this morning, as... Uh, the old teacher in me wants to do is I'm going to just take you from Genesis to Revelation this morning as well, as we're talking about Israel, as we're talking about Zion, and how important it is to frame our worldview, who we are as believers, what we understand of Scripture around the Jewish people. So that's where we're heading this morning. So Romans chapter 11 and verses 11 to 31. Now this is Paul who's taking a break from just amazing doctrinal work all the way to chapter 8. And then 9, 10, and 11, he takes a parenthetical break to speak about the Jewish people. Then in chapter 12, he goes back to how do Christians behave? How are we supposed to treat each other? So just, just a beautiful break. And in this 9, 10, and 11, he addresses Israel, because people are asking him, what's going to happen to Israel? What's going to happen to Israel? And so start, I'm going to start at verse 11. Romans chapter 11, starting at verse 11. This is the word of the Lord. Again, I ask, did they, Israel, the Jewish people, stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all, Paul says. Rather, because of their transgressions, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles... How much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the, the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the, of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, okay, so this is some of the branches, the Jewish people, and you, Gentiles, church, though, though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself, church, Gentiles, to be superior to those other branches, the Jewish people. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the roots support you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in, granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith, I want to say by grace through faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble, for if God did not spare the natural branches, his own chosen people, he will not spare you, the church, either. I'll, I'll stop doing that. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their, their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, my brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, we just sang about. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. 
And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. This is the word of the Lord. This is powerful. Let's just pray over it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word for us this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. Thank you, God, that we can gather as the church here at Harmony Road Baptist. I thank you for my brothers and sisters who believe in fellowship and have gathered here in the name of Christ. Bless every person. Bless every family. Bless all that have come here physically. Bless all who are watching on live stream YouTube, Lord. Bless every home. Bless, bless every ear that's listening, Lord. May they know your presence and the truth. God, we pray blessing over your word. We know that it is true. Help me, Holy Spirit, to speak clearly and plainly for you, and may you receive all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this is one of these questions. It isn't an exact because you asked for it, but it's because people are, are always asking about Israel and the church. And because it's so critical, so central to who we are as believers in Christ, it's important that I leave you with this message before I go. It's that important to me, so I hope it's important to you. Some of you will have different feelings about Israel and the Jewish people, but I'm going to try to help you with those feelings as I talk about it this morning. These people are probably the most misunderstood people in all of history. They've been the brunt of much prejudice, bigotry, demeaning jokes, horrific persecution. Yes, I'm talking about the Jewish people. Anti-Semitism, we could talk about all kinds of groups that, are, that the world is against, but, but none of them compare to the Jewish people, not one group, Jewish people. Anti-Semitism is alive and well all over North America, all over the globe. There's an anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism everywhere, okay? But also, what I need to remind you about, about this very small group of people, there's about 9 million people living in Israel today and Jewish people sprinkled and dispersed all over the world, okay? What I need to remind you about this small group of people is they are probably the highest percentage of Nobel laureates that there are, winning the Nobel Prizes, okay? We've seen amazing leadership and invention and, and just incredible leadership by Jewish people in, in multiple areas of, of civil life around the globe. And we've seen Jewish people whom God has placed in countries have a powerful predominance in almost any field, every field of life, whether it's entertainment or finance, okay, banking or industry, Jewish people lead the way. A people group so dispersed throughout the world, and yet today they are back in their land since 1948. They're speaking their original language, Hebrew, and they seem to be in the news almost every day. It's incredible. Now, I wonder if you've ever tried to make sense of this yourself. I'm not sure what kind of nationality you come from or whether you just call yourself a Canadian or an English person, okay? But, but have you ever tried to make sense of Jewish people, okay? It's huge. The Jewish people, Israel, Zion, the city of Jerusalem, so many people have stumbled over it. People continue to stumble over them today. Why are so many people against them? Why, are, why is there such hatred towards Jewish people? My very quick and easy answer is this. It's because they belong to God. They are God's chosen people. And when you belong to God, you'll be under attack. And so the Jewish people are under attack constantly. As one of my last messages, it's important that I address Israel, God's chosen people. Why this people are still God's chosen people. And if we want to have a right understanding of the whole of Scripture, if you want to have a right worldview of what Christianity is and who's involved in Christianity and, and what's so significant about the Bible, Israel, God's chosen people, the Jewish people, need to be right in the center of that worldview. So that's why we need to address it today. Let me remind you of a couple of verses. Genesis chapter 12. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
Psalm 122.6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Or Zechariah chapter 2. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. And they are still, the Jewish people today, are still the apple of his eye. So to understand all of this, I want to give you some really broad strokes of Scripture, so just stay with me as I work through it. Our God, one of his names is Yahweh, right? That's Hebrew, Yahweh, the only true God, the only one true God that there is in all of time and history. He has given us his word. We have the Bible, we have the Scriptures as a means for us to get to know who Yahweh is, to understand him to understand that he is absolutely sovereign in control of all of the universe over all of time, that we are to live by faith, trusting in the Lord God Almighty, that we live by faith and not by sight. Okay, that's our righteousness, living and believing in him. And also to believe that he has created all things and he has an amazing plan and purpose for all of life. He has an amazing plan and purpose for you. Okay, so just... So just wherever your aspect of, whatever your aspect of God is, God is not only absolutely humongously huge beyond us and our understanding, but God is also very personal and has a plan and purpose for your life. Amen? Okay, just stay with me here. Okay, in Acts chapter 17, Paul's trying to explain this to the Greek people. So he's in Athens. This is what he said. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. Then he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this. So why? So that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any of you. For in him we live and move and have our being. Acts 17. Like if you needed a description of trying to explain who you believe in, that's a great passage right there in Acts chapter 17. Now when God created mankind, the man man and woman, Genesis chapter 1, it says that he created them in his image. In his image he created the male and female. He gave them hearts to feel. He gave them minds to think. He gave them wills to choose. Some people would say, like, why did God do that? Why did he give mankind the ability to choose right from wrong, good from bad, to obey or not to obey, to love or not to love? Why would God do that? Well, I think it makes sense. God did not want to make androids or robots without the ability to think for themselves. He made us with emotions. He made us to feel. He made us to live in community like the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He made us to live in a relationship. That's how God, that's why God made us. He made us that we could have a relationship with him. And the ultimate of the scriptures is to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen? That's what God wants us, to love him with our, all of our mind, soul, and strength. Now, early on in time, it doesn't tell us the exact time, Some of God's angels rebelled against God in heaven. Pride was a big issue for one of them, in particular, Lucifer, Satan. They were cast out of heaven to earth. And they began to damage. The minute they left heaven, they began to do damage to creation. So we know that from everything that's happened since Genesis chapter 3. But their main target has always been you and me. Heaven casts out Satan, Satan has demons, and they hate humanity because mankind was made in God's image. Okay, so that's, they're, they're against us constantly. And they, the first thing they did was they tempted mankind and they deceived Adam and Eve, making them disobey God and to choose to sin. And the moment that sin came in, pride enters into the world and they chose to believe in themselves over trusting in God's word. So there's the fall in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, we read this. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. 
Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, all of us in this room are very familiar with this sin, because we are all sinners. Yes, we are. And we know that sin leads to separation from God. God who is absolutely holy. God who cannot, cannot accept sin. Sin brought brokenness to the world. It brought evil to the world. Not God. Sin. Sin brought all this brokenness to the world. But God had a plan because he is sovereign. And there would need to be a way for people to be forgiven, for people to be reconciled back to God, for people to be redeemed from their sin. So God had this ready. So just a few verses after Genesis 3, 6, 7 comes Genesis 3, 15. We're still in this very early part of the scriptures where we read this. God says to Satan, the fallen angel, he says, I will put enmity, okay, division between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. So very early, Genesis 3, 15, God's plan of redemption is set into place. And that means there, was, there would be a way of transforming this dark world from darkness to light, from, from being in bondage to sin to, to living in freedom, from despair, hopelessness, to hope and peace in God. Amen? God had a plan. Thank you, Lord. And that plan inv involved offspring from a woman. There would have to be a child born into the world from human flesh to be our redeemer, to pay off this sin debt that now all of humanity owes. So that person, we know, the seed of that woman is talking about Jesus, God's own son, the promised one of Israel. So this plan of redemption would, of course, include a child, which would need to have a mom and a dad, which would need to have a family. So God had to say, okay, where will this child come from? And God chose the Jewish people. Now, you might have chosen Armenia, or you might have chosen Scotland, or you might have chosen Holland. That's a pretty good country. Africa, you might have chosen Portugal or Italy. But you know what? God chose Israel. Now, we can work all day thinking, like, why would he choose this little country of Israel? But he did. It says in Isaiah 40, 40, 44, verse 1, Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. So God chose. It's like, if you want to think about adoption, this is a good picture. Okay, you, you're looking for a child. You can't have a child yourself. And you're looking for a child, and you would choose to adopt a child. You choose and that child comes to you and becomes your child. Okay, you got that? So God, God has a plan, and he chooses the Jewish people. This was the nation that he would deliver out of slavery in Egypt, the nation to whom God would give the promised land of Canaan, and the nation through whom would come Jesus, the Messiah of the world. Was there anything special about these Jewish people? The answer is no. There's absolutely, there was nothing special about Jewish people. They, God just said, I'm choosing Israel. So in Numbers chapter 7, Moses writes this, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep an oath, the promise which he made to the fathers, the forefathers, to Abraham, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So God chose the Israelites because he promised Abraham that his descendants would be great, a great nation, and they would, be, they would have a promised land, and they would bring, bring blessing to all the world. God blessed Abraham, and you can read about that in Genesis chapter 12 and 17 and 22. And there's just so many promises there to Abraham and his descendants of people, land, stars, right, sand on the shore, and his descendants. And it would be because Abraham believed in the Lord. Abraham trusted God's word, and God credited that to Abraham as righteousness. It's, it's amazing language there. He credited it to him as righteousness, that he would be saved, but then his descendants would also be a promise lineage. And so since Abraham, then we have Isaac, not Ishmael, which is another whole story, but promised land was Isaac, and Isaac went on to 
uh, Jacob, and we could keep on going to Joseph and Moses and Joshua and Esther and David and go through the prophets and through the New Testament. Let me remind you this morning as a believer in Christ, if you are a Christian, if you say you are a follower of Christ, the Christian faith is very Jewish. Very Jewish. Starting with Abraham. Now, there are 66 books in the Bible written by 40 different authors. 39 of those authors are Jewish, and Luke could have been partially Jewish. Okay, so just thinking about that. Who wrote the Bible? Almost all Jewish people. Most, if not all, written in Israel. Most significantly is that we understand that our Savior, Jesus Christ, was born into a Jewish home. He is a Jew. Jesus. Okay? The disciples, all Jewish. The gospel was written by Jewish people to reach Jewish people first and then go on beyond Jewish people. Very Jewish. And the first Christian church, all Jewish. Okay, so just thinking about our roots as Christians and how significant we are connected to Jewish people. I could go on. Now, God's plan was for Israel, named after Abraham's great-grandson, Jacob. Now, Jacob, you'll remember, was leading, trying to stay away from Esau, his brother, and they had a big fight. And, and uh, then all, all of a sudden, he hears that Esau's coming, and he says, well, i got to get ready. And he, <laughs> you know, he sends you know, most of the people and all the women, and he's kind of hiding in the back here. And Jacob's, the word Jacob means supplanter, having to do with his deception. And then he wrestles with God. Remember the story. So now he's wrestling with God. Now, God can't beat him in this one, so he touches his hip, sends his hip out, so now he's limping the rest of his life. But he changes his name. So Jacob's name becomes Israel. Now, what does Israel mean? It means, it means the one who prevailed with God. Interesting. It's very powerful. Israel, God preserves. So now we have a name, Jacob, Israel, grandson of Abraham, and now we have this nation of people under Jacob. Jacob would have 12 sons, and, and of course, there's all these promises, and these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and on we could go. Yahweh, he believed in an unseen God. They were asked to live in obedience to his commands. God wanted Israel to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. We read about this in, in Exodus chapter 19. Other nations would see that they were blessed by God, and when they obeyed God, he blessed, but they would also see that when they disobeyed God, they would be cursed. And we can read about that in Deuteronomy 26, 27, 28, 29. Moses reminded the Israelites of this important uh, be, of this, the importance of this before they entered the promised land. This is what Moses said. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? that we may call upon him. There were so many blessings, so many promises to the Jewish people. And, uh, well, let's carry on in history. Sadly, we know, sadly, we know that ancient Israel abused this relationship with God. They rebelled. They fell into great sin. Just read through the Kings or read through the Chronicles. Okay? They often wrongfully thought of themselves as superior to other people. Now, that's not what God ever said. God never said you're superior. God just said, I've chosen you. But they took that chosenness, that blessedness, and abused it. They became a very proud people, the Jewish people, trying to live life without God. So now they turned away from God. Now they're worshiping idols and getting allegiances from all other different kinds of people in the country. And they were stubborn. And they overlooked the, 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 the requirement God had for them to obey him and keep his covenant. So God had to punish them over and over. And we see that punishment throughout the kings and throughout uh, the prophets. And, and, God, and, and um, they would reject God over and they would reject his word. They rejected his prophets. They even rejected his son, the Messiah, right? They rejected Jesus. And yet they are God's chosen. And what I need to remind you of, the picture I need to remind you of is of this. If you have children, 
And let's say you have a child who is absolutely rebellious. Everything you have done, you've raised him in the ways of the Lord, you've raised him in this, or you've raised him like this, and this child is absolute, wants nothing to do with you, nothing to do with your home, nothing to do with your family, has absolutely gone AWOL. They are absolutely rebellious, living in their own sinful lifestyle, and they do not belong to God, and they do not want you. Now, is this wayward child ever not going to be your child? Your answer is no, no. For you to think anything differently would be wrong. This is your child, whether they're adopted and you've chosen them or whether they're your own birth child. Okay, they, are, they will always be your child. I want you to keep that picture in mind about Israel, Jewish people. As wayward, as rebellious, as, as turned away from God they can be, they will always be God's people. Now, that's a very important concept for us to remember for us as believers. Okay, just keep that in mind. Now, it's clear from Scripture that there was a national rejection of Israel of Jesus. And so God moved beyond the nation of Israel to another nation. We'll call them the church. So that salvation would come to the Gentiles through the church. So from reading in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, we read this. He, Jesus, was in the world... And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Then it says, he came to his own, the Jewish people, the God's chosen, but his own did not receive him. And so to all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God, born into the family. So Jesus comes to his own, the Jewish people, they reject him. It's very sad, but you can get quite emotional about Scripture, and I would encourage you to be emotional about Scripture because it's full of love and it's full of this brokenness. But in, in Matthew 23, we have a picture of, this is just before the crucifixion, where Jesus is looking over Jerusalem. Okay, let me take you to the picture. He's, can you imagine, okay, just thinking about Jesus. He's looking over the city, and this is what he says. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those I sent to you. How often I would have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and yet you were not willing. Look, your house is left desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again. Okay, there's a promise and also a, uh, a curse here. You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, that phrase is taken out of Zechariah. Okay, Zechariah 12 to 14 talks about this reuniting, which is an amazing section. So I want you to keep that in mind, all that passion God has for his chosen people. He sends Jesus to save his chosen people and his own chosen people. They've constantly, constantly rejected him. Reject, reject, reject. But does that change their status as God's chosen people? Absolutely not. Okay, and I'll tell you why that, that can't happen. Now, it says in Scripture, let's remember something really important. In Romans chapter 3, we read this. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. So this current rejection by Israel did not mean rejection forever. God doesn't change his mind concerning the things that he has promised and that includes the things that he promised to the nation of Israel. Now, I do not agree with any form of replacement theology because there's all kinds of replacement theories out there. Oh, let's swap out Israel for the church. Everything that God meant for Israel is meant for the church, whichever church you want. Okay, no, that's absolutely wrong thinking. It's absolutely bad theology. There's no point in trying to spiritualize Israel or spiritualize the throne of David or spiritualize this or spiritual let's not spiritualize at all let's keep it physical let's keep the fact that God still has a chosen people Israel God now has a special nation the church and they work in tandem beside each other they are not the same so no replacement theology that's not that's not good theology we the church have been blessed by grace through faith as we read in Romans chapter 11, we have been grafted into the promised lineage, the tree, uh, and we, get, we have promises that ourselves, but there is still 
promises for Israel. I want you to notice a couple of things with me. Paul lays it out quite clearly in Romans chapter 11. And he explains uh, about the children of Israel, their previous position as as his chosen, and their current position, as we read, a hardening, as you you saw there uh, in verse uh, 26, 25, that there's a hardening, or as branches that were broken off, but he certainly doesn't leave it as though they are left out forever. Look at some of the following quotes. Look at verses 11 and 12. Okay, so now look at your scriptures. Romans 11, 11 and 12. Again, I ask, did they, the nation of Israel, stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all, Paul says. Rather, because of their sins, their transgressions, salvation has now come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Okay, so there was a reason for all of this. But if their transgressions means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring to them? So the current position of having stumbled isn't a fall that won't recover. Okay, nowhere in Scripture says, does it say that Israel will never recover. In this current age, their transgression, which we, would be the rejection of Jesus as their Messiah, has led to grace, salvation by grace through faith, to us, the Gentiles, to the church today. But Paul anticipates a time, as we're talking about these riches, when the greater riches will flow from their fullness, when they are restored and God's promises are fulfilled to the Jewish people in the Messianic kingdom. Now, let me also read, let's also continue to read other passages. Look at verses 23. Again, and if they, the nation of Israel, did not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again, to come back into faith. Okay, he follows this by saying that not only can it happen, it will, it is going to happen. Paul didn't want us, we, the church, the Gentiles, okay, to become proud, thinking or conceited, as the scripture says, that Israel has been rejected. And look at us, look at the church. We are so like, and so that's where the replacement theology comes in. We get conceited, we get proud. Look how special we are. All those Jewish people, they're bad people, and we've replaced them out. Absolutely not true. Look at verse 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you will be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. So Israel currently has had a hardening, a blindness, some people say, towards the gospel. Uh, After that, God again will return and fulfill his promises to them as a nation. Look at verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now that verse 26, we do not know when the fullness of the Gentiles, I'll say when God says, okay, the church is full, if if I can put it that way, the number of those being saved and elected to the church is, is enough. Fullness is the language there the full number of the Gentiles. Well, whenever that fullness of the Gentiles happens, there will be a rapture, okay? Rapture, church is gone. Then a tribulation period where Israel will be going through a very difficult time. And at the end of that difficult time, it says there in verse 26, that's when Israel will be saved. A deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn their godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them. Now, we can read a lot of this in the Old Testament. So let me encourage you, when you're reading Ezekiel 35, 36, 37, when you're reading passages in Isaiah 50, 59, 60, all the way to 66, as you're reading, as my readings took me through Jeremiah this week, so I was blessed in Jeremiah. But let me read to you what it says in Jeremiah. At that time, so after the fullness of the Gentiles and when Christ returns to Zion, At that time, this is Jeremiah 31, 1, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword, okay, have to go through this terrible time of tribulation, partly because of discipline and and persecution and trial. At the end of that terrible period, they will be my people. The people who survive will find favor in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. 
The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with an unfailing kindness. I will build you up again. Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Proclaim it to distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and watch over his flock like a shepherd. That will happen in the millennium when the children of Israel are back, all of them back in Israel. Jeremiah 33, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. And in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord a righteous Savior. I wonder who that is. It's Jesus. When Jesus comes back again. So this is not spiritualizing. This is accurate. This will happen physically when Jesus comes back. Now the important part of all of this, verse 28. Look at verse 28, Romans eleven twenty-eight. 28. As far as the gospel is concerned, they, the nation of Israel, are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, my promises, my, chose, my choosing Israel, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Irrevocable. Now, this is important. This is important for us, not just Jewish people. This is important for us. It's irrevocable. God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. He will not and does not turn back on his word. Amen? God's word is faithful. You and I can, you, you and I are believers here. We're coming to church. We're counting on heaven. We're counting on being saved from our sins because of the promises that God has made. The moment you say, oh, God doesn't keep his promises. God didn't really mean what he said to Israel. You know, that was then. This is now. The minute your mind goes there, you're in big trouble, right? Because God's word is true. God's word is faithful. It is irrevocable. So he will not and does not turn back on his word. And while presently Israel is against the gospel, in general terms, okay, there are Jewish people, there's some great things happening amongst Jewish people. Some, many of them are coming to Christ. But until then, because the patriarchs and the promises to them are covenant and promise, God will prove himself faithful. There are so many other beautiful promises in scripture as you read uh, from Zechariah chapter 12 and and 12 and 13 and 14. But here's the key point I want to make for us today is this. To believe that God will not fulfill his promises to the nation of Israel or to say that God has taken his promises away and given them to someone else would cast great doubt on both God's character and God's sovereignty. And that would be false to think that way. It would say that God doesn't keep his promises, that God changes his mind, or possibly cannot do what he promised, both of which are untrue. So wherever you are on this, on this understanding of who the Jewish people are, your understanding of the Jewish people has to be connected to God's promises, and does God keep his promises, yes or no? Okay, so if you think the Jews aren't who they were, and God, they're not God's chosen people anymore, you're in scary ground because that means you don't believe his promises are for you and his promises aren't going to last. So let me just remind you of some of the promises. Like there are some many, many great promises in scripture that uh, are important. Thousands of promises throughout the Bible. We read in 1 Kings 8, 56, not one word of God has failed of all the good promises he gave to the servant Moses. The Apostle Paul reminded the Corinthians that he preached to Jesus who is totally trustworthy. He can count on Jesus. Jesus is reliable. This is what he said in 2 Corinthians 1.20. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. He keeps his word. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ and so through him, the amen is broken by us to the glory of God. All of God's promises are a yes and an amen. Can I hear you say that? Yes and amen. We're counting on his promises. Amen? Yes, we are. Okay? I am with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, my grace is sufficient no matter how difficult and no matter how weak you are. My grace is sufficient for you. He says, the Lord, I will fight for you. 
Now, we don't get this very well. We think that's kind of Old testament but But, you know, when you're in a struggle, God's promise says, I will fight for you. I will be there for you. I will fight the enemy off. Call on me. So God's word can be trusted. His promises are true. Let's live by the promises. So let me finish with this. I'm sorry this has been long, but it is all of Scripture. And uh, uh, think about this question. Is Israel still God's chosen? Okay, Isaiah 9, verse 6. Uh, in Romans 9, verse 6, is a, is a similar question. Has God's word failed? Same kind of question, right? Are Israel still God's chosen? Or, or has God's word failed? And the answer is no, not in any way. Amen? No, God's word has not failed in any way. Not in this current age, where there's still a remnant within the Jewish people that have faith. Not in the future. Not in the future. When after the full number of Gentiles has come, God will return and save the nation of Israel. Why? Because God's gifts and his calling are irrevocable. He is forever faithful. We can count on his word. Now, this is our blessed assurance. Amen? Blessed assurance. We can count on God's word. And so Israel can count on God's word for a kingdom to come. They are still his chosen people. And so my prayer for you this morning, as you're reading your Bibles, as you're listening to the news, where's Israel? We should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We should be people who love God's people, the chosen people. So we should have a special interest in what's going on in Israel. All of world history will finish in Israel. Not Washington, not Moscow, not Beijing, not London, not Ottawa. Sorry, not Ottawa. It's going to happen in Jerusalem. Why? Because all of world history is going to stop when Jesus returns to Jerusalem does the battle, and enters into a millennial kingdom with the chosen people of Israel. So keep your eyes on Israel. Keep your ears to, even now, okay, as Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. That's significant. Okay, how Biden deals with Israel, and now the Netanyahu is out and Bennett is in. That's interesting. Okay, who's sitting in Jerusalem in the Senate? Okay, what, are, are they more moderates? Are they more biblical or less biblical? These are all applicable to your life as a Christian. Why? Because your life as a Christian is tied to Jewish people. It's tied to Jerusalem. It is. Okay, so as much as you may not, under, a, lot of dis, a lot of misunderstanding about Jewish people throughout history, like they've been maligned terribly by different groups from crusades and onward, okay? Just, just maligned, maligned, maligned. But your worldview of Christ, his return, your life the promises you're counting on to be a, your citizenship in heaven, to everything about Jesus, is all tied to the Jewish people. So let me say this. Keep your eyes on Israel. Keep your eyes on Jerusalem. And they are still God's chosen people. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We know that it is true. Forgive us, Lord, when we limit our ability to understand. Forgive us, Lord, when we check it out. And we just say, oh, God, it's too complicated. Let me just live my life. Oh, God, forgive us. Forgive us when we get proud. Forgive us when we get narrow. Forgive us when we get personal and kind of not check into the, you have this great, big, beautiful program of sovereignty and, and righteousness and salvation. And, Lord, may our eyes be open. May our hearts be ready. Lord, may we as believers in Christ know that, 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 we, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior that by believing in the Lord Jesus, we are saved. And Lord, that is our desire for all people, our family members, those in our community, our neighbors, that they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they would have hope in their futures. So God, thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts, and may we live by your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Terry Trotter. Terry's going to now lead us in a time of prayer. Morning. The service this morning uh, just particularly hit me as 
as a foretaste of what we are going to enjoy, all of us, eternally in heaven. And I think too often we, uh, we focus on other things uh, of this world, partly because we are, uh, God has made us in a, in, uh, to focus on material things, uh, just getting by on a day-to-day -day basis. But I, I think what we need to do is to focus, uh, as we've talked about this morning, on, um, on God's words, his promises, but the acknowledgement that we are only here for a very short period of time. Uh, as I get older, I start to realize how short that time is coming. Um, my definition of old is changing dramatically. <laughs> um, so I think we need to have that focus on God and God is on God's promises. And I think less on this. I think this has been our world for the last almost two years now. And I think we need to step away from this. I'm not saying physically or I'll be arrested or whatever. But I think from the standpoint of where, where is our trust, uh, vaccines come and go, <laughs> or we're on to the next stage of maybe boosters and, and whatever. But I think, it's, uh, I think it's important that we draw back and say these things are going on in our life. We have to do certain things at certain times um, to go forward in, in certain ways uh, in our life on a daily basis. But we have to keep in mind that we need more quiet time where we are uh, alone with God and with God's word and that we're, we show God that we are also trusting in him for all the promises that he has made to us and that we have that blessed assurance and that we need to recognize our God and to come to him uh, daily through Christ. I had uh, I was reading uh, Psalm uh, 99, and uh, I think it's maybe an appropriate way of opening our prayer time this morning. Uh, I'm just going to read the first three verses, uh, and I could stop at the first. Um, the Lord reigns, regardless of what we see around us, uh, that God is sovereign. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all his peoples. Let them praise our great and awesome name. Holy is he. So as we go to prayer this morning, uh, I would ask you and myself, that we turn down the volume of the world, that we may focus on God. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that we can come to you this morning uh, with confidence, trusting you, uh, knowing your sovereignty, knowing that you have a great plan for each one of our lives, that you have called us into uh, various situations, different families, different occupations. And Father, we thank you for the gift of the time that you've given us here. And yet at the same time, Father, we uh, recognize that we are going to be yours eternally because of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. The perfect sacrifice and the blood that was shed for each one of us that we may be called your children. So Father, we acknowledge our weaknesses. Uh, Father, we are frail and broken vessels at times. Father, I pray that uh, you will forgive us. Uh, Father, where we sin, where we fall away, I pray, Lord, that you will forgive us for uh, our lack of obedience. 
Father, too often we seek our own way and we discard the, your word and the way that you would have us go. So, Father, give us strength through your spirit that uh, each day that you will uh, direct us, that you will move us on the rails of righteousness, that we will stand firm for your word. And, Father, we lift up your church this morning, not only Harmony Road, but so many, Father. And while we see so many failures uh, within the church universal, and particularly in North America, Father, we thank you that we can trust in you, that we can hold to your word, that you, you will always uh, deliver us. So, Father, we thank you, and we pray, Lord, that you will continue to work, that you will continue to convict those people within the church that your word is true. I pray, Lord, that you, for forgiveness for them, and I pray, Lord, that you will have mercy on them. And, Father, I pray this morning, uh, particularly for Harmony Road, and we have so many praise issues, uh, Father. We thank you for Bruce. We thank you for the way that you are uh, working in his life in terms of healing on his collarbone surgery. We thank you for Morgan and the good response that she's had to medication. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have uh, for a chapel hour at, uh, at Centennial Retirement Home. Father, there are so many opportunities that we have to hear your word. Uh, over uh, television and radio, and we thank you for those opportunities. We thank you, O oh Father, for the SU Sports Camp that was here, and we pray, Father, that your gospel message will go be out, will go beyond with those children and with those families. And Father, you have planted the seeds, and we pray, Lord, that they will continue to mature and that they will produce your fruit. And Father, there are a number of issues uh, that we have uh, concerning illnesses, and Father, we, we lift up uh, Elgin to you this morning. Father, we thank you for him. We thank you for his service to you in so many ways for so many years. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will comfort him today that he will know your peace. And Father, we, uh, we pray for Trina and the uh, mass that has been discovered and for the specialist. Father, we pray that you will give them your wisdom in assessing the situation and assessing any medical procedures that will follow. And Father, we pray for, for uh, Barb's sister Marnie and her cancer situation and for Millie's uh, nephew battling throat cancer. Father, in both cases, we pray for, for healing, and we can trust you, Father, in all of it. But the greatest gift of all, Father, is salvation for each one. Father, we pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will touch their hearts and will move them and draw them, uh, that they may accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And Father, we thank you and we pray for Bob, for strength and healing, and for John and Anne Marie with their brother-in-law, Les, and his hip surgery. And Father, we also pray for uh, Nancy and Dave. And Father, you know all of the complications and situations that they are facing. And Father, I pray that you will, uh, you will touch them, and especially today, just to give them that sense of peace that only you can provide and the strength that they need to go through each day. And Father, we pray for those who are waiting for testing with Bill and Bev. And we pray, Father, for those who are uh, receiving cancer treatment. And Father, they, so many of them have been on such a long road that they have depended on you totally. And we lift up Faith and Morgan and Janet and Linda and uh, Bill Ray for daily strength and healing. 
And Father, we pray for the Christian camps uh, reaching out with the gospel. And Father, we also pay f pray for uh, Karen and the passing of her brother-in-law, Paul. Father, we pray that you will be their support, that you will be uh, all that they need. Father, and I pray for those around the family who don't know you, that they will come to know Jesus. And Father, we pray for the unsaved, Father. Each family in this congregation knows or has close friends or family. Uh, for people who have turned, in most cases, turned their backs on Christ. Father, we pray that you will, we beg for your mercy that you will do a wonderful work in their lives, that you will turn them around from where they are uh, to that eternal life through Christ. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning, and I pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless us as we go, that we may, we may know that one day we will be with you in glory. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Just quickly here as we wrap up uh, the announcements this morning in front of you. So just be aware of what's going on. There is a baptismal service being planned for the 29th, and there's at least three people that have already spoken about getting baptized. So if it's on your heart, if you know the Lord is saying, I've made a decision for Christ, I am a believer, I've never been baptized, talk to myself, call the office, and we'll speak to you about a baptism. On Monday nights, we're continuing on in our series, Frontline Ministries. So this is tomorrow night, we're in South Asia. Very interesting ministries, different missionaries. One's a barista, and one's a baker. Then there's a pilot, and then there's farmers, and how they're all working and using the gospel to reach other people for Christ in South Asia. So come on out. Ladies Bible study this Wednesday. It's a morning service at 9.30 for fellowship and being in God's word and our student blessing, it's, it's hard to believe. It's the, I know, it's August the 15th, and where's the summer going? But we've had such a beautiful summer, haven't we? Just It's been such a beautiful summer. But the 29th is our student blessing send-off. So I've been working on a list, and it's changed quite a bit from last year. So many people have graduated, but there's still 18 or 20 people who are heading off to college. And uh, just a reminder of that on the 29th. It'll be our time to recognize. I have a list I'm working on, and if you have any you'd like to make sure I get that name on the list or you want to make sure I know where your son or daughter is and what year they're in, appreciate you calling me or the office so we're sure. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Ed to come and he's going to close us off. We are told that the Messiah was a promise to Israel. And the scripture verse that came to mind as Pastor was mentioning about the, the Jewish nation. And a reading actually we ascribe this most of the time to the Christmas story. But it says here, And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Israel is not forgotten, but remembered. And so are you. One day the Lord is going to come and take his church home to be with him before he fulfills all the prophecies concerning Israel and the kingdom. And so we're going to sing together in our hymn books number 549. What if it were today? A stand. Jesus is coming to earth again. What if it were today? Coming in power and love to reign. What if it were today? Coming to claim his chosen bride. All the redeemed and purified. Over this whole earth scattered wide. What if it were today? Glory, glory, joy 
to my heart will breathe. Glory, glory, when we shall crown him king. Glory, glory, haste to prepare the way. Satan's dominion will soon be o'er. Oh, that it were today. Sorrow and sight shall be no more. Oh, that it were today. Then shall the dead in Christ arise, caught up to meet him in the skies. When shall these glories meet? our eyes what if it were today glory glory joy to my heart will bring glory glory when we shall crown him king glory glory haste to prepare here if he should come today watching in gladness and not in fear if he should come today signs of his coming multiply morning like breaks in eastern sky watch for the time is drawing Father in heaven, we thank you for your word to us this morning through your servant. We thank you, Lord, that you've reminded so very steadfastly how you prepare and have prepared Israel to be the blessing you desire to give to the human family. We thank you, Father, now for each one gathered in your divine presence. And Lord, as we look at our world around us, we wonder, Lord, just how much longer could it be but we cry with John the, the, in the book of Revelation at this closing chapter. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen.